Good afternoon, and welcome to this afternoon's AEI virtual event. Will the commercial real estate market rebound as the economy reopens? I'm going to put some slides up to guide me, guide us through a, a short introduction. Uh, my name is Paul Kupiak, and I'm a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. So I'm going to try to set the stage here. Um, first of all, commercial real estate is a very large asset class. After residential real estate and equities, commercial real estate or CRE is the largest in this third largest class of investments. The chart I have here, I borrowed from a paper, a research paper, which shows different asset classes as a percent of U US GDP. And the light blue line is commercial real estate. And you can see it's below residential real estate, which is the red dash line and uh, common stock, which is the yellow line. And this, this chart only goes through 2016, uh, but uh, I suspect it's still indicative of the importance of commercial real estate in the economy. Now the coronavirus has, a, has also infected commercial real estate. Shuttered businesses and the unemployed have a difficult time making rent payments. Here's a, a clip from a piece that appeared in the news media a day or two ago, and it's the uh, percent of uh, people in a survey that uh, either didn't pay their rent or their mortgage payment or only made partial payments. And you can see that has jumped significantly since uh, we, we, we came under the influence of the coronavirus, uh, in, in fact, you know, uh, it's close to 32% uh, for renters in June. Uh, so, you know, the, these are people that, 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 that pay the cash flows that support commercial real estate. So when tenants skip rent payments, you know, commercial real estate owners have a dif difficult time servicing their debt payments and paying property taxes. From yesterday's Wall Street Journal, we learned that about 7.5% of the commercial back uh, mortgage securities uh, were 30 or more days delinquent at the end of the May. And that had at the subcomponents, 19% of the hotel loans were delinquent and 10% of retail loans. Now it turns out that many of these, um, many of these property owners have borrowed from the commercial mortgage backed securities market, which is essentially capital markets money. And they're having a hard time negotiating uh, debt restructurings or, or debt, uh, debt delayed payments. Uh, the CMBS owners have to go through a special servicer. The servicer is the one that pays the bondholders and the, and the servicer may, may have to replace delinquent payments. And so it's a difficult process and it's, it's not so easy. When the, when the debt that funds uh, the commercial properties is owed to a bank, the borrower may have an easier time renegotiating payment restructurings uh, because of they have might have a longstanding bank relationships and banks are sort of more flexible historically in in uh, seeing some of their customers through problems like this. The capital markets people have a more difficult time. You may have seen in the paper also recently that there's a there's pressure from Congress on the Secretary of the Treasury and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve to try to come up with programs to help the the commercial mortgage backed securities markets. Uh, it, because of these difficulties of, of delinquent payments. Now, the coronavirus has had a lot of impacts on commercial real estate. Um, and going forward, uh, these impacts could be, you know, last a long time, depending how long uh, it takes before we get a, a, a viable vaccine or a cure. Uh, social distancing, uh, the, the need for social distancing may make many buildings obsolete. Skyscrapers and office, you know, skyscraper apartments don't work very well without elevators. Elevators really aren't compatible with social distancing. Uh, there's a new preference for remote work arrangements, so there's less need for office space, perhaps. Is it that long term or is it or is it short term? Open office plans, are they still viable? Will people have to restructure uh, how that how that works? Uh, social distancing alt alters all kinds of business models, which I'm sure you're going to hear about today. Uh, reduced capacity, re restaurants and small retailers struggle to survive. Many may fail. Population density is not a very uh, good thing when you have a coronavirus uh, running around. 
mass transit puts people at risk, uh, center city properties, usually prime real estate status, high rents, will be able to be, be able to keep them. The sum of all these and other things that we're gonna hear about this afternoon are gonna put pressure on uh, commercial real estate rents and occupancy rates. And if that happens, uh, you know, there'll be an impact on the owners and lenders for commercial real estate. So let's take a little bit of a look here in figure two at who owns commercial real estate. So this is taken from a, from a recent research paper and it goes through 2016. And this, this sort of plots the share of non-residential structures in the United States and who their owners are. So most commercial real estate is actually owned by non-financial corporates. And those are, those are uh, you know, firms, could be industrial firms, could be lots of firms. And those kinds of properties, some of them are financed with mortgages, some of them are financed with equity and just unsecured debt, uh, but they're the biggest, the biggest owners of real estate. After that are corporate financial uh, holders, which include REITs, which we'll hear about today. Uh, and um, you, can, you can see as it goes, sole proprietorships, partnerships, these are the owners of the real estate. Now, these owners have to finance their real estate and where do the loans come from? Uh, I borrowed a, a piece from a relatively recent Mortgage Bankers Association docu document on the topic, which basically says banks are a big funder of commercial real estate, commercial real estate loans. Uh, the GSEs uh, fund multifamily, and which I'm including in commercial real estate. Uh, life insurance companies, the securitization market, commercial mortgage-backed securities, and other sources. So that's just kind of a feel for who's on the hook for loans on these properties. So I'm a, I focus a lot on banking, and so I'm going to sort of end my little introduction with a, a word about that and ask, will the virus send many banks to the intensive care unit? Um, many banks have large exposure to CRE. This is not new. We've known this. Uh, they've had over the years, uh, but let's take a look now from the March, recent March regulatory reports and take a look at CRE loan exposure across the banking system. Now, I am counting as commercial real estate loans, loans that banks make that are backed by non-residential, non-farm real estate collateral. I'm calling land acquisition, construction development loans uh, as CRE loans. Loans backed by multifamily real estate, hotels and apartments as examples of that, and commercial mortgage-backed securities that banks own. Now I have not included undrawn commitments, so the numbers could even be a little worse than, than what you see here. So when you look at the largest banks, sort of the ones we think of as the SIFIs, uh, banks bigger than 100 billion in asset size, this, this plots the ratio, the number of banks at, for different groupings of the ratios of the commercial real estate holdings as a proportion of total bank equity as of the end of March. And you can see most of the big banks have relatively limited commercial real, real estate holding as a proportion of their equity. There's a couple of banks out there over two, over two, and you might think that they're getting maybe a little bit of concentration there. Let's go to the, the mid-sized banks, the regionals uh, between you know, 10 billion and 100 billion. And here you see the distribution of commercial real estate holdings as a percent of equity it increases quite a bit. I mean, you have a number of banks there that are, you know, above three, four, even, even more than five. Uh, but where the, where the problem really could lie is in the community banks. When you look at banks, the community banks, banks less than $10 billion in assets, uh, you see that they have, you know, a lot of them a lot of exposure to commercial real estate. Uh, there's 20, over 2,500 of them that have a, a ratio of, of more than twice their equity invested in commercial real estate. More, you know, more than 1,500 of them that have more than three times invest of their equity invested in commercial real estate. And you can see the numbers. So, you know, it wouldn't be shocking if uh, if if uh, the COVID crisis carries on too long that you might not see. Uh, maybe a wave of uh, problems in, in smaller banks uh, and maybe even some mid-sized banks, but um, that's something to, to keep in mind. So what is the outlook for CRE investments? Uh, today, I have, I'm lucky to have with me a panel of experts and 
I'm going to introduce our experts in the order in which they speak. Speaking first will be Spencer Levy, who's the Senior Economic Advisor and Chairman of the Americas Research for CBRE. He oversees all research activities analyzing the latest real estate trends within the Americas. Speaking second will be Calvin Schnur, who is NAREIT's Senior Vice President of Research and Economic Analysis, <clears throat> follows the macro economy and how developments in the macro economy impact REITs and commercial real estate properties. Following Calvin will be Bert Ely, who is a principal consultant in Ely and Company. He's an analyst and a commentator, and he specializes in banking, mortgage markets, and monetary policy. And our fourth expert today is Chris Whalen. He's an investment banker, writer, chairman of Whalen Global Advisory, and he provides analysis and commentary on issues impacting the banking, mortgage finance, and fintech sectors. So I'm going to turn over the Zoom floor to Spencer Levy. Uh, so welcome, Spencer. Thank you very much, Paul, and good afternoon. What I'm going to talk about today is CBRE's outlook towards commercial real estate, addressing many of the issues that Paul started today's conversation with. And I'm going to break my, com my comments into three categories. Category number one is the macro environment and how it may impact real estate. The micro environment, talking about the facts on the ground in real estate at the moment. And then secular. And what do I mean by secular? Secular meaning that there have been many conversations about acceleration of trend for the various uses of different types <clears throat> of commercial real estate. But let me begin with the macro first. And CBRE is in the more optimistic camp towards the overall economy. And we reached that conclusion for a couple of reasons. Number one, CBRE is a global company, and I speak to my colleagues in Asia and Europe on an almost daily basis about what's happening on the ground. And what's happening on the ground there now is encouraging, while it is imperfect as it is everywhere, while we have seen a reclosing of the economy in parts of Beijing, for the most part, China is largely functioning. We see every Starbucks open, every shopping center open. But from a commercial real estate perspective, we see office property tours, tours for people that want new space at about 75 to 85% of peak level. So almost normal for office seeking uh, tenants. Now, it isn't all perfect. We still are not seeing a lot of intercity travel. We are not seeing a lot of large purchases of cars and homes, but we have seen a recent uptick in the purchase of automobiles. And we believe that some of these trends are going to come here largely because Asia generally, but specifically China, Taipei, Seoul, and elsewhere are following what we call the three T's, testing, tracking, and technology, which enables them to reopen even in the event of a rise in the virus. We see that coming here and we know it's coming here because we poll all of our largest occupiers and CBRE represents almost 90% of the Fortune 500. And they are all gonna implement some measure of the TTT approach where they're going to allow their employees or require their employees to self-test while they're at home so that they can safely come back into the office if they are uh, not infected. And we will allow us to protect those who are or are most vulnerable. So that is why we are in the optimistic camp overall. While we do believe there is a significant risk of a double dip in the fall, we do not believe it's going to lead to a total shutdown, uh, which is why our forecast is for the economy to grow to about negative 6% in 2020, but then the rebound at about positive 6% in 2021. Um, and that then brings us to our real estate forecast. And so normally when I'm on calls like this, I speak about the future, three, five, 10 years from now. For a moment, I'm gonna go into the next 90 days and I'm gonna go right back to the chart that was just shown by Paul at the outset, because I am tracking collections on the ground on a daily basis because CBRE manages almost 8,000 assets in the United States across all the major asset types. And there's some good news there and there's some bad news there. The bad news is that collections are down, uh, but not across the board. So multifamily apartments have done reasonably well, over 90% collections. Industrial has done reasonably well at over 86%. Uh, even, even retail has stabilized, albeit at a very low level between 50 and 60%. The one area that's giving us a little bit of pause is that the month over month comp of collections from April to May in office deteriorated a bit from about 86% collections in April to around 80% in May. Now, what we are hoping for is for us to get to bottom 
so that we can bounce back. And what does bottom mean? Bottom means price discovery. One of the fundamental challenges we have today in commercial real estate is that owners don't know what their assets are worth. And because the owners don't know, the banks are having trouble lending to them because they don't know what the loan to value is, the V and LTV being value. Now, from our perspective, we believe we're going to get to bottom in several of the asset classes in the next couple of months. And that's going to be retail, industrial, and office. But multifamily might be a few months later out because multifamily is being supported by unemployment insurance, which is keeping collections there higher. One of the key fundamental differences between this crisis for people who are trying to compare this to the global financial crisis or to the post 9-11 tech bubble period is that the level and quantity of government support is light years better, which has raised the bottom from our worst fears about what could happen to the economy generally and commercial real estate specifically. So we are more optimistic about commercial real estate this time in terms of the speed of recovery than we've had in prior crises. Now, when I say speed of recovery, I wanna be clear. Our forecast for commercial real estate has been broken into what we call a one, two, three scenario. The one scenario are those asset classes that are likely to bounce back in year one, and that is industrial and multifamily. But even within these asset classes, you are going to see differences based upon region and based upon sub-asset type. So a big box warehouse distribution that focuses on e-commerce will bounce back faster than small bay flex industrial, which has many small contractors that are impacted in similar ways to retailers. In a similar fashion, we think multifamily, while it's going to have a challenging 2020, will start to bounce back in 2021, both in terms of decreased vacancies and rent starting to increase. But there are certain sub-asset types within multifamily, notably senior housing and student housing, which are going to take longer to recover. The two categories, the one where I'm going to spend the most of my comments on today, which is office, and, and office we believe is going to bounce back in about two years. Now we all know the next 18 months are going to be very challenged in office, particularly in large CBDs that are dependent on both mass transit and on these elevator systems that makes it very challenging to get people in and out of these buildings. As an example, I was speaking to one of my colleagues in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying that if Salesforce Tower were to comply with all local social distancing guidelines in San Francisco, they would need to have a line two and a half miles out the door. And by the time everybody got into the building, it would be time to go home at night. Now in our three category is retail and hotels, which are gonna take much longer to bounce back. But once again, much like the other asset types are going to be categorized into shades of gray because certain type of retail is already bouncing back. There's something that's known in economics as pent up demand and pent up demand, my friend in uh, China, Henry Chin termed it revenge retail, where people just want to get out and spend. And we're already seeing that in China. And we are increasingly seeing that here in the United States in restaurants. You will increasingly see that in luxury goods as well. That same type of pent up demand for spending is already showing up in hotels as well. But let me be very clear about hotels. Hotel, the shades of gray matter there the most in terms of the various types of hotels, starting with those that are most challenged, which are those that cater to international travelers. The second most challenge, the business traveler, and the one that's actually bouncing back quite nicely now are the drive-to or so-called staycation hotels. I am literally getting in my car right after this call and driving to North Carolina to take my son to a travel baseball tournament, and I'll be hitting three or four hotels along the way. This is my fourth week of doing it, and in these hotels, they are largely full and people are happy to go there, albeit they follow social distancing guidelines, masks, and the like. But let me go back to office for just a moment, because if there are two areas where I've gotten the most feedback negatively in the last couple of months is our relative optimism on the economy, and two, our relative optimism on office coming back after the fact, after the COVID crisis has passed. And what is our relative optimism on the office space based on? Well, it's based upon all of our CBRE's research that we've done over the last 10 years and other sources that prove one thing. People don't go to the office because they need to go to the office. They go to the office because they want to go to the office. And those want factors have existed for decades, not dissimilar to people don't need to go to restaurants 
They want to go to the restaurants and people are going to go back because the office environment in every survey we've done show that people go to the office because it helps you attract and retain talent. It helps your company create the culture it wants to create. And this one is the key. It allows the professional to create the soft skills required so that they can advance professionally over the long term. There have been studies that showed that you can be, for certain types of workers, more productive working from home in part because you're not commuting anymore and because of certain functions. And there's a terrific study by Stanford University from 2015 on that point. But in that very same Stanford study, they showed that there were negative impacts on the professionals personally. And in fact, many of the people in that very study who had self-selected to do work from home, self-selected to go back to the office after the study. So what do we see happening in the office sector? We see office bouncing back in about 18 months, and you're going to be, see some changes in terms of greater wellness, greater HVAC systems that are cleaner air, whether they are forced air or new systems that have come into play with zapping the air with ultraviolet-like or new systems altogether called hydronic HVAC, which doesn't pump air, but pumps hot and cold water into your floors and ceilings, and other things like that. In the short term, you're going to see less occupancy. You're going to see less, see more social distancing. And you're going to see janitorial services going from the back of the house to the front of the house. Also in the short term, you're going to see some move to the suburbs from the CBDs. And we're already seeing that in suburban New York. Well, when I get on the call with my colleagues in suburban New York, they tell me that they're already seeing an increase in what they call TIMS, tenants in market, looking to take temporary space of one to three years in suburban New York to house their people, including in co-working space, because not all co-working space is the membership model highly condensed. Some of it is demise space, not the similar you'd see in a regular office, albeit under a short-term lease. So let me sum up my comments like this, and I'll pass it back to Paul. Commercial real estate is in a better place than it would have been by any expectation, by any measure, in large part due to the government support. And we expect this government support to continue, but we need more. We need more particularly in liquidity to address the issue that Paul just addressed in the CMBS market where there is no liquidity or very little liquidity and people particularly in retail and hotels are having trouble refinance. And so I would suggest to you that if we see more of that, the worst case scenarios as it relates to commercial real estate and the banks and others that finance it will not happen. But overall, we believe that commercial real estate will bounce back much faster this time than it has in prior crises in this one two, three scenario led by industrial multifamily, secondarily office, third, retail and hotels. And with that, Paul, I pass it back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Calvin. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, one thing that Paul did not say in the introduction, so I'm Calvin Schnorr, senior economist at NARI. We represent REITs, uh, which own about 10% of the commercial real estate in the US. And Paul, you forgot to mention that we first worked together at the Federal Reserve Board quite a while ago in the capital markets area. And it's nice to be working with you again on this. Uh, my comments actually have a lot we of similar both, themes. We were both at the IMF, Calvin. <laughs> that, that as well, uh, <laughs> a long career here. Um, my comments have a lot of similar themes with Spencer. Actually, I'll first off by saying that this is just an absolute massive shock to the US economy. We're, we're aware of that, everyone's aware of that. Um, I'm also on the more optimistic side for some of the same reasons that Spencer was just mentioning, in particular, the strong government support. I'll have a slide showing something that you might probably have not seen yet, um, but also the conditions in the economy prior to when this crisis hit. One of the other themes, though, is that it has hit different parts of the economy in a very different way. Uh, the parts of the economy that are most closely linked to face-to-face -face interactions that are interrupted by social distancing. This differential in the impact on the economy carries over into differential in commercial real estate. That's why Spencer mentioned hotels and retail. Actually, he said retail and hotels. I'd flip it and say hotels and retail. Uh, but there's some other commercial property sectors that we're gonna talk about. Uh, he, he mentioned office quite a bit and industrial. I'm gonna talk about some of the new types of commercial real estate that are closely tied to the internet economy that are a pretty big part of the REIT sector, particular data centers and cell towers. Um, within the commercial real estate sector, it actually has a better prospect for dealing with the challenges it faces right now because real estate also started off with better fundamentals than it did prior to the great financial crisis. And I'll have some slides with that. 
And at this point, let me go and share the screen here and click share. Okay, there's the opening slide. What we're actually gonna see is a bit of a two track economy. And here what I'm doing is looking at the components of GDP growth in terms of their contribution to first quarter GDP. You know, when, when we saw that overall GDP fell at a 5% annualized rate, it didn't fall across the board. If you look over on the left-hand side, the first two bars there are food services and accommodations and recreation and then durable goods. Those are basically the retail and lodging resort sector in commercial real estate. The third, and, and they, they accounted for a very large part of the overall decline in GDP. Uh, the next one over is healthcare. A lot of doctor's offices and dentist's offices shut down completely and that took off two percentage points from GDP growth. The, the, the next category over was foods, food and beverages for home consumption. Grocery anchored retail is an important part of the retail universe. And that's actually had a very strong demand just because we're all buying food to bring it home and cook it at home. I'm gonna skip over a bunch of the others uh, for now, but let, let's look at the next. So we see that the pattern is very much concentrated in a few sectors. But well, what typically happens in a recession is you don't see declines in services. You see a decline in fixed investment. And what you can see here is that I put the bars around the fixed investment line. That is usually the biggest drag on GDP growth. It was almost a non-player in the first quarter. Now we're expecting fixed investment to be pretty weak in the second quarter. This includes commercial construction, residential construction, as well as equipment and software. Uh, durable goods were also weak. That was mostly autos, also some furniture, and that's actually bouncing back pretty quickly already in the middle of the second quarter. So again, the macro fundamentals really show a very disparate impact across different parts of the economy, and that translates into commercial real estate. What's well, not just in GDP that you see it. If we look at the job losses in March and April as a percent of the total job losses, that's in the, the, the dark blue lines here. Accommodation and food services, the hotels, that, it, was the, it was the restaurants and bars that shut down, the hotels that shut down. And they accounted for about a third of the job losses, which is three times their share of total employment, which is the light blue line. So you can see that there's a very much concentrated, um, concentrated impact on this one part of the economy. We've seen it in stock returns as well. This is the different REIT property sectors and the returns year to date as of about 10 days ago. And the two left hand side of the lodging and resorts uh, actually down 35% year to date total return. Retail down about 30%. Uh, several of the other sectors had smaller, smaller declines. But then you look and you see data centers, infrastructure. Infrastructure here is not bridges or public infrastructure like people talk about. This is in infrastructure for the internet economy. This is basically cell towers. Uh, the, the data centers and cell towers have a total return this year of 15, almost 20%. They're close to 20% as of, well, until today's sell-off, they're down quite a bit. Uh, a 20% return is good in any year. And for these sectors to be up 20% when the overall market is struggling like, uh, like it is, tells you an awful lot about how this part of commercial real estate is faring very differently. Paul mentioned the, uh, the, the CNBS delinquencies. I was in the Wall Street Journal, it was actually published uh, the, the delinquencies were published a bit, a bit earlier. Uh, here you can see the hospitality, the hospitality uh, delinquencies are 18 or 19 percent in uh, June, and they had been less than one percent in March. Retail also, uh, I think I have one a month earlier than the numbers that Paul has. I guess he has more up-to-date ones. I didn't update this slide. What you're seeing here is a very disparate impact on the hotels and the retail. Multifamily has still fairly low delinquencies. Office, very low delinquencies. We expect those to be rising though. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. This is, this is the different REIT sectors. REITs are involved in all of these parts of the economy. And the, 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 the grayish bar up towards the 
upper left includes the retail, the shopping centers, the lodging and resorts, and so on, as well as some others that are having a very negative impact. Uh, but within REITs, which are listed real estate, publicly listed real estate, more than half of the market cap uh, are sectors that are getting some benefits from the increased use of the e-commerce, uh, the electronic economy. Because one thing that uh, we know is that commercial real estate houses the economy. Most economic activity takes place in real estate. And actually the REIT sector has a greater representation of the internet real estate than most other sectors. Uh, so that's just a, uh, another sh slide showing the disparate impact on the various parts. This is the final part that I'm going to talk on the macro economy. Spencer was saying we have a lot of support, the support being the Fed's lowered interest rates. They have a lot of lending programs in place, and we have you know, several trillions of dollars that have been pumped into the economy. Well, where's that stimulus money gone? Most of it has not hit the economy yet. We are already seeing a rebound in consumer spending. We're seeing a rebound in housing activity. And there's, I mean, a typo in the side. I said there's an extra 2.2 billion, that's 2.2 trillion. There's an extra 2.2 trillion dollars that's sitting in bank accounts uh, since the money was distributed. That's 10% that's of GDP is basically in the bank ready to be, set, to be spent. So this is the dry powder. This is the, the, the spending power that's gonna fuel the recovery once we get underway. What about commercial real estate? I mentioned in my opening remarks that the, the conditions prior to the crisis were almost as important as what's happening right now. And one of the points I'm really gonna focus on is the level of construction that we had prior to the crisis. We did not have overbuilding. It's a fairly, fairly benign building environment. We did not have a huge binge of construction that led to a supply overhang. And I'm gonna do a flashback to the great financial crisis to look at what happened in office markets across the country, depending on how much spending there was, uh, construction there was. So this first slide is showing across 350 different metro areas the x-axis is looking at construction as a percent of the stock. Most cities had construction of one or 2% of stock. There were some that had four or five or 6%, a few that had very, very high construction. And then the y-axis is showing the change in vacancy rate over the next, uh, the next two years. And you can see that there were uh, many that had changes of less than 500 basis points, less than 300 basis points. But it looks like there's a general uptrend. Uh, I can tell you the statistically regression finds a strongly statistically significant uh, slope to this, that higher construction very clearly leads to higher vacancy rates. If I look at the top 20 metros with the bubble showing the size of the office market, you can see a similar thing there. Now this makes sense because one of the things that makes commercial real estate so cyclical is the time it takes to complete a project. So something that was built, started prior to a downturn may be delivered right at the depths of the downturn. And the last thing you want when you have very weak demand is a huge supply wave coming on. Well, where are we right now? If we look in the great financial crisis, I looked at the different cities according to how much construction they had. If they had less than one and a half percent, the left bar, uh, they basically had very little rise in vacancy rates. The middle bar, one and a half to four percent, had about 150 percent rise in vacancy rates. It's the ones that had more than four percent uh, construction underway that had a huge increase. Well, at the end of 2019, the total construction was 2% or less of the existing stock. That's suggesting that we're not facing this type of supply, supply overhang. Uh, there are a lot of other issues with office in terms of longer term demand. Spencer mentioned some of those, uh, but this is illustrative of how the fundamentals are supporting it. This holds across most of the other property sectors as well. I cover two final points fairly quickly. Commercial property prices had had a steady rise up until the crisis. What that's done is a lot of the building owners had un un uh, unrecognized gains that's gonna protect the debt holders. It's gonna give them some cushions, give them some cushion against, uh, against the losses that they're gonna face from lots of income. Of course, a rise in property prices gets us also worried, are the prices too high? And indeed the cap rates for most property types have trended down, had trended down quite a bit from uh, 2010 through 2019. And indeed they are lower than they had been during 
uh, the period ahead of the great financial crisis, but we're in a low yield environment. So if we look at the cap rate spreads to the treasury yield, they were actually in a moderate range. Um, there, there was some fairly, there was some fairly, uh, Uh, there was rational pricing for a lot of, of the properties. Uh, one final point along this, debt growth. If I go back to the slide on prices, the growth of total commercial real estate debt was several percentage points behind the growth of prices. That is, debt, growing, debt growth was less than the increase in the value. So there was a general deleveraging of commercial real estate over this period. That gives the debt holders some extra protection. I said one last slide, but there's actually one more. We also conduct a rent survey among REITs and I'll just look at the numbers. Most of them are in the 90% range. Uh, the retailer at the bottom, some of those are not collecting very much in March and April. We're gonna be releasing, in April and May, we're gonna be releasing the June numbers tomorrow, uh, but most of them are in the 90s to 90 and higher. Part of this is because not only is there a difference across property types, but also by the quality grade. The higher grade properties, which REITs tend to own, have more stable, financially stable tenants. And most of them are you know, making 95 or, or more percent of their, their payments. That's gonna protect the, the, the debt holders as well as the property owners. So um, I'm pretty much at the time here so we can have discussion later on. But my overall overview of this is, yes, it's been a huge shock uh, there is a lot of support for the economy in terms of stimulus money that still is, is not even working its way in, but it has a very different effect on all the different property sectors. Uh, lodging, hotels, re uh, retail are going to take quite a while to recover. Office has some long-term structural change. Many of the others actually are not in that much trouble considering the size of the economic shock. And that's that. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, Bert, Bert Ely, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you. Let me get my slides up here. And um, uh, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, uh, to be with uh, you all today to talk about this. Um, and I'm going to, um, uh, bear with me just a minute, get the slides clicking. Um, there we go. Um, Sorry about that. Let me get back to the beginning of the uh, presentation. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, again, Paul, for the opportunity to be here. Um, and I'm just going to uh, run through some uh, some key points I want to make. Present a little bit of, uh, of data. Uh, since COVID has struck, we're seeing, at least uh, on a temporary basis, uh, tremendous shifts in, uh, in where people work, uh, particularly if they have been working in offices. Uh, we've also seen, of course, major changes in how goods and services are, are purchased uh, and significant changes in how goods and services are actually delivered, uh, such as uh, uh, the tremendous pickup in uh, delivery activity by uh, FedEx, uh, UPS, and, and, and various delivery services. Um, and uh, also major changes, of course, in how people are getting from point A to B. Uh, much more reliance, in, uh, as someone mentioned earlier, about uh, uh, traveling by car. Uh, while we're seeing some pickup in uh, air travel, uh, it's still way off from uh, where it was before the crisis struck. So again, I think we're all aware of that, living with it day to day as to uh, what these uh, changes are. Uh, and then, then, of course, uh, enormous changes in, uh, in what people can do for fun and entertainment. Uh, movie theaters closed, uh, uh, professional sports and uh, amateur sports essentially uh, on hold for the time being. And uh, people having you know, to spend much more time at, at, at home, uh, you know, watching uh, videos or, or, or whatever. But again, very, very significant uh, changes now in terms of people are spending their time. In terms of... Uh, uh, commercial real estate and, and valuations. Uh, you know, my sense is that uh, well, uh, some properties will uh, obviously perform better than others. That uh, uh, we're going to see uh, in in many properties, particularly older uh, properties, uh, reduced rental income because of uh, rent reductions and increased vacancies. And something I don't think has been stressed enough yet, and that is how much 
permanent job destruction is is going on. Uh, if a, if a store goes out of business, uh, the, the the jobs are gone. Uh, if a restaurant goes out of uh, uh, shuts down, it's the same thing. There's a lot of going concern value, if you will. It's an intangible value, but a lot of going concern value that is being destroyed uh, uh, week by week. And uh, for those businesses that have shut down or gone through very significant uh, uh, reductions in uh, scope, uh, they're not going to come back uh, that quickly. And that's where I think there's possibly excessive optimism about uh, uh, how uh, fast the, uh, the economy will recover. The other thing that we're seeing, of course, and that is higher operating expenses uh, related to uh, uh, COVID uh, protection, uh, protections that have to be put in place, particularly all of the, the cleaning that has to be done and all of the preventative actions that are being taken to uh, prevent the further spread of, uh, of COVID. Um, excuse me there. Um, bear with me, a little mistake there. Um, so, um, you know, what are some of these impacts? Uh, first of all, within buildings, uh, improving the, uh, the air quality to reduce uh, the spread of disease, uh, you know, less crowding of, of workers in, in open space offices, and much greater emphasis on the cleanliness of uh, the public spaces, the lobbies, the elevators, the restrooms, uh, uh, the break rooms, and so forth. And a lot of that is going to continue. That's not going to go away. Um, and of course, outside of buildings, uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, major questions being raised about uh, uh, building location and design. And uh, I don't think it is beyond the realm of uh, possibility to think of not so much the death of the central city, but uh, uh, a, a reduction in, in, in the importance of central city activities because of the density of central cities and of uh, particularly the, the crowding that takes place in, uh, in local transportation, uh, uh, particularly in terms of, of, of public transportation. And of course, we've seen uh, a greatly reduced uh, inner city travel, which of course has been noted earlier, you know, has had an impact uh, certainly on, on hotels and, uh, and, and, and motels. Now, um, uh, in, in my opinion, these changes and the extent that they persist you know, are having a significant demand, uh, altering the demand for various types of CRE. And um, uh, I would suggest that uh, some types of CRE, and I'll use movie theaters as, as an example, are now obsolete in, in, in uh, vast oversupply and in effect to become what are known as stranded assets. Uh, that is ultimately there has to be a different use found for them. And to the extent that we do have uh, uh, stranded assets. This is going to mean uh, enormous losses for investors in in the surplus uh, commercial uh, uh, the surplus areas of, of commercial real estate. Obviously, uh, that's going to vary by by type of uh, real estate. And of course, lenders with mortgages on uh, on obsolete or surplus uh, commercial real estate are going to face losses uh, when those properties eventually are uh, uh, disposed of. And uh, I think there are going to be some uh, important secondary impacts taking place. One of the things that uh, uh, I have noticed is uh, the impact on local government uh, revenues uh, because of uh, not only declining business taxes paid by businesses uh, such as restaurants that have uh, uh, shut down, but to the extent that uh, property valuations are and property assessments are going to be lowered, that's going to mean uh, reduced uh, real estate uh, tax revenues, particularly for local governments that tend to be highly dependent on uh, on real estate uh, taxes. And then I think longer term, this is going to have some uh, uh, effects on land use planning that maybe we're only starting to begin to, uh, to understand. Um, uh, but for that real, for the, the CRE that, um, for which there's still uh, a demand, uh, I think there are going to be some significant uh, modifications that are, are going to have to be taken on that have already been uh, uh, touched on, particularly in terms of uh, <clears throat> the quality of, of indoor air, uh, uh, cleanliness, and modifications to the uh, uh, public spaces. Just to cite one example, uh, in Europe for some number of years now, there's been uh, an emphasis uh, in office building particularly to require more windows that can be open uh, so that uh, the workers have uh, can get fresh air coming in directly from outside. You know, I wonder if to what extent that might uh, start to become a trend in this country, which could mean uh, 
uh, changes in existing buildings to to allow more windows to be open, which has, of course, uh, uh, some interesting effects on uh, in, uh, uh, ventilation systems within the buildings. And one of the questions that I then start to wonder about, particularly when we talk about dealing with uh, uh, restroom issues and elevators and lobbies and so forth, and that is whether or not there are older properties that simply may not uh, warrant uh, that uh, the degree of investment that will be needed. Maybe we can come back to that during the uh, discussion period. Um, and then uh, particularly with regard to, uh, to, to properties to become obsolete, are there uh, going to be properties that are candidates for conversion to, uh, to other uses? Uh, we've already seen, uh, particularly in the Washington area where I am, uh, a number of office buildings that have been converted to, to apartments and, uh, and, and condominiums. Um, we're going to end up with, uh, I think, uh, a number of movie theaters and uh, movie theater complexes that get, gets, get shut down. It's just kind of a uh, somewhat blue sky thinking. When you think about what a movie theater is, it's basically a, a big hollow shell. And uh, I wonder if some of those will... Um, uh, be converted into warehouses if, if someone gets uh, creative about that. But one of the things that I particularly wonder about in the more urbanized areas, that is what happens to street level, to the spaces now devoted to street level retail and to restaurants. I think a lot of those particularly smaller independently owned establishments, uh, once that they're going to be gone and, and uh, uh, we're going to see a lot of vacancies uh, in, in that type of uh, of, of space. And of course, we're seeing a number of chains that are uh, uh, cutting way back. And so uh, I think at the, at the retail street level, uh, we're going to see uh, 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 some interesting questions that come up about how is, uh, how is that space going to be reoccupied if uh, retail and restaurants don't come back uh, uh, very rapidly. And I think um, in some cases, uh, you know, the best option may be uh, uh, demolition and uh, eventual reuse of, of the land for another purpose. Um, another factor that I think will come into play here and that is the extent that people relocate away from densely uh, populated uh, areas, at least for the short term. I think longer term, people will come back into, into cities, but in the short to medium term, the extent that people move away, that could actually uh, exacerbate uh, the vacancy uh, problems uh, in the, uh, particularly in the larger uh, metropolitan areas. Um, now, in terms of the macroeconomic impacts, uh, I'm a little more pessimistic, I think, than the previous speakers with regard to the, uh, 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 to the overall sh shape of the economy. Uh, I think we're in for a, 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 a relatively prolonged slowdown. I think the, uh, the recovery may be more um, a shape of a W or the Nike swoosh rather than uh, uh, the V. And this is going to have a, a, a drag on uh, construction projects, particularly the, the start of, uh, of new projects. And I think we're going to, that in turn is going to be a drag on GDP growth uh, for the next uh, few years. And I also think we're going to have a relatively uh, slow return to a full employment economy, in part because of the number of jobs that are being destroyed by businesses uh, basically going out of business and because it takes time to start a, a new business as versus to uh, bring back employees in a, in a business that is already uh, established. Um, now, uh, one possible offset on, on this is uh, that uh, for those buildings that uh, where it's economically uh, 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 makes sense, that there be a, you know, a fair amount of uh, investment in building conversions and upgrades. And when I look at uh, all of the, the different things that need to be done to uh, bring, uh, let's say, an office building up to this, what is now a, a, a new standard, I believe, in terms of cleanliness and sanitation, uh, uh, th that's going to cost uh, uh, some money. And um, uh, that is going to, I think, uh, uh, lead to a, a, you know, shall we say the next phase of all this, and that's going to be a lot of uh, a loan restructuring and, and bankruptcy activity um, that in turn could be a, a, a drag on CRA, CRE lending and investing. And it's very interesting, just in the last couple of days, the articles that I've seen about uh, what the impact is going to be uh, of uh, a negative impact of having a substantial uh, jump in uh, in, in uh, bankruptcies and among other things, uh, the, the capacity of the bankruptcy courts to, to handle that. 
uh, activity. And then, of course, as we've heard about already and particularly been reading in recent days, and that's going to be the, uh, the impact of loan defaults on, uh, on CMBS. And to the extent that, that it, it takes a while to work through those problems, I think that's going to be a drag, not only on commercial real estate, but on the economy overall. And it's raised, you know, leads to a, a question that uh, other panelists may have uh, some, some thoughts about, and that is longer term, are, uh, is the impact of, of COVID on uh, uh, commercial real estate going to be such that uh, investors are going to be uh, a little more conservative going forward, and that might lead to uh, less leverage in CR lending, CRE lending than has been the case uh, in, in, in recent years. Now, in terms of the impact on, on banks and other lenders, um, obviously, uh, as has been mentioned, Paul mentioned before, uh, banks are uh, major CRE lenders. Um, at, uh, at March 31, the most recent data we have, uh, uh, total uh, commercial real estate, that is non-residential loans, uh, on the books of the banks were $1.5 trillion. Uh, now, some of that, because of the way the FDIC collects data, is, pardon me, on uh, uh, non-U.S. commercial real estate. But, of course, to the extent that uh, there are problems elsewhere, particularly in Europe, uh, that will be a drag on the, uh, on the bank's Community banks held almost uh, $480 billion, about almost a third of uh, uh, the total industry's uh, CRE lending. And that is almost entirely domestic. Uh, and I, I think the commercial bank, a lot of the uh, community banks fairly heavily uh, invested in, uh, uh, in lending on commercial real estate. And what we have seen in past cycles is that commercial real estate has been a major cause of uh, community bank failures. And uh, I think we're gonna see the same thing again uh, uh, this, this time around. I haven't made any, any projections on this uh, yet, I will be, but uh, I think we will see uh, over the next couple of years, a, a step up in the number of commercial bank failures and um, uh, they will be uh, uh, in um, driven in part by, uh, you know, basically, uh, uh, troubled uh, loans in that sector. The other thing, of course, is that the banks have uh, uh, almost a third of a trillion dollars of, of construction loans on their books. And uh, some of those loans are going to get into trouble. And that will add to the pain uh, that the banking industry um, uh, uh, is exposed to. And then, of course, we have the, the CLOs. Uh, the, 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 uh, different opinions about uh, the extent that the banks have uh, exposure there uh, might be be harmed by it, but it could be another source of, of, of pain uh, for the banks. I think an interesting question, and an earlier speakers have talked about this, and that is, what? how permanent are these impacts going to be? Some are short term, and I think others uh, longer term. Uh, as, as was mentioned before, People basically are social beings, and so I don't think social distancing will will uh, 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 last that long. In fact, some would say in some cities it's already disappeared, uh, and that will be especially the case if, if vaccines are developed. And uh, so I think socializing will rebound, and that's going to restore demand for restaurants and entertainment and and places to play. So I think uh, you know the only question there is how quickly will the uh, rebound be. I think that people will uh, want to uh, re return to centralized workspaces and re resume traveling for uh, business uh, and, and, and pleasure traveling. And someone mentioned uh, previously about people wanting to come to work. Well, it's for schmoozing and networking. And the interest in, uh, in, in those activities uh, uh, certainly hasn't gone away. It's actually very uh, necessary uh, in terms of functioning within organizations. And so I think it will rebound. Um, but uh, the question is what kind of circumstances are that going to uh, take place in? And so this raises a question, um, uh, will there be a, a new normal or, or will the uh, world return to the old or more disease, uh, but to a more re disease resistant normal? And that's where I think we're going to go, but it's, there are going to be costs and disruptions uh, along the way. And one of the things I just want to leave as a, as a closing thought, uh, as I've tried to get a handle on the, the breadth of the complexity of the many challenges that are facing uh, commercial real estate today. 
I find it interesting, very worthwhile just to read the many headlines in, in the financial press because they actually uh, summarize in just a few uh, words what all these different uh, uh, challenges are. And I think that that's something that we don't want to uh, oversimplify about uh, how many challenges are and the complexity uh, of dealing with them. And so I look forward to our discussion and audience questions. And thank you, Paul. Uh, thanks, Bert. Uh, Chris, Chris, you have the floor. Uh, yes, ask uh, Bert to stop sharing. Ah, there That's we go. Sharing. Excellent. Let me just do this. Um, do this. Um, do this. Hopefully, it won't blow up again. All right. Um, thank you so much for uh, having me, Paul. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, I spend a lot of time on banks, but I also spend an enormous amount of time in the mortgage space. And I'm not going to go over some of the material that's already been covered, but I am going to try and uh, sharpen up some distinctions about how I see things unfolding. Um, you know, the market's big. We've already figured that out. It's also very lumpy. You cannot make annual or cohort type observations about commercial real estate because every loan is different. Now, that's the case in residential lending too, but these loans are really different. And they have characteristics that require uh, professional monitoring and professional servicing in a way that you don't have to with, commercial, uh, with consumer loans. For example, uh, I worked at Cole Bond Ratings. I helped build their financials team. They have a group of people up in Horsham, Pennsylvania, and all they do is look at CMBS deals, look at the borrower, look at the tenants, look at the rent rolls, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very complex analysis. But what I think we can say is, yes, the numbers that you've already heard so far are worrisome and they are large. But I will also say, as the title of my talk suggests, that there's going to be an enormous amount of forbearance uh, involved here for the simple reason that we don't know what else to do. Uh, I think looking at the great financial crisis is not helpful because that was basically a liquidity crisis and a crisis involving a lot of private label consumer residential mortgage loans that were not backed by the government. Here we have an asset class that is almost entirely private and which luckily, and this is a very important point, has professionals on both sides of the table. So in many cases, they won't file bankruptcy. They won't litigate because there's no point. They already know what the reality is. And so my belief is that the good news on commercial is that the parties involved are all going to sit down at the table and say, okay, what do we do? Uh, the bondholders are going to pay for this in the world of CMBS simply because the investors have no direct interest in the property. They have to wait and see what the servicer and the trustees do. Uh, but in the rest of this world, these assets are managed directly by REITs, by insurance companies, by banks, and they're going to restructure them. Now, let me go to the next uh, page. This is a chart you've already seen. I excluded the corporate number that Paul uh, included. This is kind of the financial world's slice of commercial real estate held by different issuers. You know, it's an interesting way to look at it. It is very large. Now, you know, the thing that's remarkable looking at the first quarter data from the banks is how good the numbers still look. Uh, residential, in fact, all of the real estate exposures that were mentioned by the earlier speakers have had negative credit costs for almost five years. We've been showing negative loss given default on just about everything that touches real estate. So when people say that there wasn't overbuilding and there wasn't speculative activity in the sector, I would politely disagree. Uh, I think when you see loss given default negative for multifamily properties for years, which means we are recovering more than we're charging off on that body of loans, it suggests that credit has no cost. And we know that that's not true, but this is thanks to our friends at the Fed. They have driven money into this asset class. And you've also had regional uh, situations like New York, where we just went through a decade of frenetic building. We had more construction in this town than we've seen in a long, long time. And much of these properties are now up in the air in terms of both valuation and what we're gonna do with them as assets. Uh, Bert mentioned worries about unemployment, business failures, et cetera. I would 
you know, suggest that New York City is exhibit A. We have decimated the entertainment, hospitality business, anything related to people coming into this town to have a good time is closed. And street level retail is dependent on tourism. It's dependent on visitors. It's not dependent on residents. So when you look at this town today, it's empty. I could get on my bike tomorrow morning and ride all the way down Broadway to South Ferry. And normally I would not do that ride. It's too dangerous if there's a lot of traffic. There's nobody here. So I think that we have seen a, a kind of cataclysmic event with this COVID shock that has really challenged the legacy template for the use of cities and the use of commercial real estate. And I'll give you a very important example that we're gonna to touch on. Residential real estate is doing great this year, thanks to the Fed. We're having a boom year. We're gonna do two and a half trillion dollars worth of new originations this year. The industry sent everybody home because they had to, but they continued to do business. In fact, they had higher call volumes because of people looking for help, and they had higher volumes coming into their call centers. The top five lenders today are doing 70 to 80% recapture on their mortgage servicing rights through refinancing, and it's all coming through their call centers. That is the most profitable business you can do. So big bright spot for the US economy, residential real estate. Now, here's what it looks like. One to four family loans, zero defaults. If you look at loss given default on the right side of the screen, you'll notice that the number is negative. Why? Because if somebody actually defaults, and there aren't many defaults, they sell the property and they make money. They pay off the full amount of the loan and then they still have money left over. That is not normal, as you can see from the chart, but that's where we are. Every asset class that touches real estate in the United States looks like this. So my own take, going back to the comments from our friends from NARI and CBOE, is that I think that there is going to be price compression simply because we had such an amazing run up in prices. And I think that is going to be very much on a case by case basis, the use of the building, the location, et cetera. But still, uh, we've had an amazing run in this city and we have a stock of both commercial real estate and high end real estate that is going to be sitting around for, for a number of years here in New York. So let me go to the next one. Um, you know, I already touched on this really in terms of the change, but again, let me give you a, another very tangible example. I know of two very large financial services companies that you've all heard of who are planning to move out of New York. And the reason they are going to do this is there are several liability, concern about their people, um, but they've also discovered that they can work remotely. They've discovered that they don't have to be in downtown Manhattan or Jersey City. I'm, I'm kind of giving you a hint as to who it is. But these are big tenants. And when they go, there's not going to be anybody to replace them. So I think the fact that technology has made it possible for people to work so efficiently and so easily in remote contacts is, is having a big impact that we haven't even seen yet. It's going to be years, really, before we understand what's going on here. Because as was mentioned before, Things in commercial real estate take a long time to happen, to build, to change usage, et cetera. Now, let me um, show you what commercial looks like. This is commercial and industrial. This is both commercial loans to businesses, but it also includes an awful lot of real estate exposures. You'll notice that it's kind of normal. It doesn't look like the real estate charts. In fact, loss given default for commercial loans has been going up for the past six quarters. I think that number is gonna be over 100% next quarter. In fact, I think just about every chart that many of us on this panel look at from the FDIC is gonna skew rather dramatically in the next quarter. And let me give you something to think about, something to listen for in earnings next week. If we see bank provisions higher than they were in the first quarter, when they were up 370% to $52 billion, that's bad. If we see banks come in lower than that number, that tells you that they're getting comfortable with what they see and they're starting to figure out how much money they got to put aside for credit losses in 2020. But I'll tell you this, this is not 2009 when the industry charged off, I can't remember, Paul, $110, $120 billion. It's going to be twice that. 
And that's why I raised the 1930s metaphor with broad, very wide disruption of industries, employment, et cetera, because this is not like 2009. This is gonna be much more like 1933, 34, 35, in my opinion. Uh, final points, I would say, look, the Fed has done a lot with liquidity, but the Fed can't fix solvency. They can buy people's bonds in the market, they can buy CMBS, but they can't get involved in the resolution process. They don't have the legal authority. The only agency we've had in this country that could do that is the Reconstruction Finance Corp in the 30s, and then the various vehicles we created in the 80s and 90s to clean up the SNL mess. The FDIC is another such vehicle, but they focus on banks. I think we're gonna to need to create some sort of vehicle at either the state or federal level to deal with some of these issues as we go forward, because frankly, the courts are gonna be overwhelmed. Um, I think most of the restructuring we're gonna see in commercial real estate, and I think we are going to see a lot, is gonna involve the parties sitting down at the table and talking. They'll probably wipe out the equity, flip a lot of the debt into new equity for the building or the mall or whatever it is, and they'll keep on going. But again, I would emphasize that I am pretty pessimistic about the numbers this year because when I saw that first provisions number from Chase and some of these other big lenders, it really, um, you know, I think raises serious concerns about what they see going forward. And remember, our friends at FDIC don't break out loss provisions by category. They just give us one big number. So while we can see the results for the different loan categories, Historically, we don't know what they're putting aside for each loan category for provisions. And as a result, you know, we, we don't really have a full picture as of yet. So I'm going to leave it there, Paul. Thank you, Chris. Um, I want to circle back a couple points here. Um, you just mentioned residential was looking one to four family loans uh, performance didn't look bad at all. But the CARES Act, of course, allowed government guaranteed loans to uh, uh, not have to pay if, if, they, if they've been impacted by the virus. They're not allowed to be booked as delinquencies. They're not. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and in, in some places, well, the CARES Act also let apartment renters, you know, not pay and not be evicted. And yeah. I'm not sure if that had the same, uh, you can't touch their credit, credit rating thing that that they did with the mortgages, but you know, to the extent, how, to what extent is that skewing the numbers that we're seeing, making them look better than they actually are? And are we going to wake up, you know, in 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 July, August, you know, after that, and and see, you know, see a lot different numbers when when it, you know it could go it could go up to a year, and and how much has the congressional uh, approval of being delinquent on on your credit it's okay to do that according to congress and you know they certain things in the cares act but how much does that spread over to other to other debt classes where you know the it's an erosion of the you know credit culture it's you know extend and pretend forbear you know it, it uh and i'll leave it at that who, who may want to jump on that chris first maybe well let me just go in order um i think the industry has a pretty good handle on borrowers that have requested forbearance assistance to date. What's very interesting, it's about a third of them are continuing to pay their mortgages. The reason for this is several, but suffice to say, if you're in a, a forbearance program, you can't refinance. So the industry, I think, is pro proactively dealing with this, in part simply by refinancing borrowers who are in trouble and, and loosening up of the cash flow in the household. You know, so you refi them. You get, it's a rate refi, by the way. They're not pulling cash out, but they, they could maybe skip a month or two because the economics are such now, the spreads are so wide, Paul, because of the Fed and just other factors that the industry's essentially generating so much float from prepayments every month that they're financing the float they need for the COVID loans. Think about that. It's, it's mind boggling. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, if unemployment goes up, and I am afraid of that later in the year, then loan defaults will follow. They're very closely related. Um, right now, there's still very much tightness in the bottom two thirds of the residential market, if you think of it in terms of agency loans. So there's no supply. 
And I don't think the price of those homes is going to go down. But I do think loss given default for the entire class of one to fours is going to go back into positive territory very definitely. Now, pricing is going to help. But, you know, we're, we're in such a strange world because of the Fed and quantitative easing. Uh, it, it, it's hard to say what's going to happen six months or a year from now, to be honest. Alan, please. I'd like to follow up on that. I think this is a really interesting discussion. And Chris, thanks for your comments. But I would be cautious about taking someone who's missed one month and then missed two months and extrapolating out to three or five and then, and then a default just because the underlying cause of the missing the payment is so different in this crisis than was previously. Mm. You had a typical recession in the past. If the economy got worse in one month, it actually meant that for the next six or nine months, it would keep getting worse and worse and worse. We've never had a situation where we said, we know that for this business, their cash flows are going to be shut off for two months, and then they're going to come back on. We've never had a time when we could see it come back on. It's not going to come 100%. It's not going to come all back. But we've never seen something where people knew, I'm probably going to miss two months of payments here, but I do see the cash flow coming back in in June, maybe July. And that actually gives you a reason why forbearance makes a bit more sense, because an end date may be in sight. Well, I think it was a smart thing to do, but let me give you another example. When you're closing a resi loan today as a, as a lender, the day you close, you're going to do another appraisal and you have to verify that their employer still exists. Okay. If you don't do that, I guarantee you the GSEs will kick the loan back at you in six months or a year. So that's the environment we're in. And many of these lenders are actually with Fannie and Freddie, they're just taking the loans to the cash window. They're not even trying to securitize them because it's too much risk. And then with Ginnie Mae, they're going to pools in days. They're not holding those loans on the warehouse line for two weeks because the banks won't let them. They, they go into pools in two days and they assign the, uh, the trade forward so they're out and they have their cash. But the home mortgage market is another area where it's just very different from it was in 2008 because then we had had a half a decade of subprime mortgages with just massive amounts of leverage. The amount of home equity a typical homeowner has right now is three or four times what it was, maybe even more during that crisis. So that's the reason why you're seeing the uh, negative loss given default is because they, they got home equity. That's going to oh, protect yeah. our, the lender. Yeah, and there's no supply. But that's a comforting thought. Let's put it that way. I, I'm not looking for one to four is to go down in valuation very much, uh, uh, except for the inferior assets. Bert, Bert did you want to add something? Yeah, um, I, I think that uh, we got to take a look at the basic question, which is how fast uh, is uh, our jobs going to come back? How how quickly will the unemployment rate uh, decline? And my sense is, for reasons I mentioned in my remarks earlier, I think it's going to be a sluggish recovery for two key reasons. Number one, uh, despite all the current talk about another round of, of stimulus, uh, I don't think it's going to be come that quickly or be that uh, significant, given how uh, high the uh, the federal debt to GDP ratio is rising. I mean, that is really getting to a scary level. But the other thing is a lot of jobs uh, have been destroyed. It's not just that people have been laid off and can quickly come back, but that the employer uh, has uh, either gone out of business or significantly uh, downsized. Uh, on a, and, and therefore, to the extent that jobs have been lost, I don't think they're going to come back that quickly, which means the unemployment rate is not going to drop that quickly. And the longer that rate stays up, the more you're going to have people uh, in financial difficulty, taking personal bankruptcy and facing uh, foreclosure. Oh, yeah. Well, think about this. Every restaurant in New York City has had to convert to delivery and pickup only. They let go of the wait staff and they keep the kitchen staff and a couple people to run delivery. Uh, Spencer, you want to weigh in there? Yes, um, I, I listened with great interest uh, to the excellent comments of all of our uh, panelists here, but I do have to uh, at least challenge some of the assertions by Bert and Christopher about the death of cities, the death of retail. Um, notwithstanding my optimism, um, we're all guessing as it relates to the secular shifts in the retail industrial office but where we're not guessing is if we take a look back at comps of even perhaps worse uh, time periods. And the period I would point to is 9-11. Post 9-11, nobody wanted to go back into New York. Nobody wanted to go back into a tall building. And there was a period of time after 9-11 when people were paying lower rents, were paying higher rents for low floors than for high floors. 
What happened? There was a secular shift in security and people got more comfortable and New York ended up stronger than ever. What happened post Hurricane Sandy? Same thing. Much of lower Manhattan infrastructure was destroyed, came back stronger than ever. You can go all the way back to 1911. Everybody goes back to 1918. I'll go seven years further to the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911 that killed 146 primarily immigrant women because their bosses locked the doors to prevent theft. What happened after that? The offices got safer. They got better and the city bounced back. So notwithstanding, in fact, I have great respect for Bert and Christopher and their comments. Um, I think that if we take a, a broader view of this, I think any comment that suggests that there's a permanent secular shift in the cities in retail or otherwise is premature. If we get a vaccine, all bets are off. We're back to normal. Or, I mean, if we get a viable yeah. but, you vaccine. Know, the, Paul, that's, that's a key because point. Our stock yeah. is so old. You know, a lot of it's to Bert's earlier point, it's not worth investing in. The new stuff is great, but New York City is old, old stock of both resi and commercial. And you know, look at Third Avenue. What are we going to do with that? Have you have you been to Wall Street recently? And to yeah, buy, 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 I ride my bike. And, and, and you <laughs> will ride your bike and look up because most of those buildings used to be old office buildings and they are now some of the most expensive condos in New York City. So yeah. New York City is resilient. It will adapt. And even these older buildings have value if they do if they take that adaptation route. I, I, I don't I hate to sound like a provincial, but uh, there's a lot more to the United States than just uh, uh, New York City or Manhattan. And what what I'm concerned about is across the, the, the whole country, we have seen uh, broad uh, job destruction uh, and problems uh, in cities uh, and towns of, of all sizes. And so this is not some local event that has occurred after 9-11 or a hurricane, uh, any hurricane. This is economy wide and uh, at an enormous cost to the economy. And the big question I think is, is to what extent can the federal government keep pumping money into the economy at the, at, at the levels they have, and to the extent that that slows down and there's a drag on it, and we're already seeing indications that that's going to happen, I think we're going to see a very sluggish uh, recovery. And the slower it is, the longer it's going to take for jobs to be, new jobs to be created. Let me, let me come back to something that I'm surprised nobody mentioned. Uh, all the all the trouble in um, you know our marquee cities, the rioting, the looting, these are you know all the same places where the density is high and um, and nobody brought that up. Is you know is is that is that is that the summer of love and it goes away and everybody's happy to go back to Center City or or no, uh, it was already a problem, Paul. I I know most of the big developers in the city. My landlord's one of them. They they invest elsewhere. Here in New York, they are the enemy, and the politics are so poisonous. You know, AOC just trounced Michelle Caruso Cabrera last night in the uh, Democratic primary in Queens. Uh, this is not friendly territory for investors, and the the irrationality and the indifference that we get from Albany and from the mayor's office in this town is scary. So, you know, I, I would not go long New York real estate. I rent. That's my option to, to pull the plug if I have to. But Back to Burke's point, it's um, Spencer. I'll come to you. It's it's not just New York. It's it's in a lot of cities, inner cities. So Spencer, maybe you want to speak to this. Well, yep. um, the the situation is is very complicated, very long term in nature, um, and uh, I I would hope that they can combine, kill two birds with one stone in the sense of, I hope there's another uh, federal stimulus package that includes infrastructure for some of these most impacted areas. Uh, I live in Baltimore um, and uh, we uh, are still recovering from the terrible events of 2015. Um, and so it's very challenging to come back from these things, but I do think there's a window of opportunity here if we took, put one and one together, which the stimulus combined uh, with that. But uh, uh, I don't, I'm not gonna harp on the New York thing because the, the market is bigger than New York, but I'm bullish on New York long-term uh, it is the most resilient market in, in the world. Uh, if you look over the next 12 to 18 months, I'm with Chris. It's going to be challenging over the next 12 to 18 months. But beyond that, the amount of infrastructure, human capital, 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 uh, and all, every other factor will bounce back. 
And in a few years, we'll be looking back on this and say, wow, New York really did bounce back as it always does. And, and, and maybe New York will bounce back. But what about the rest of the country? I keep coming back to this thing that there's a lot more of the United States uh, than just uh, New York. And uh, we have a, a lot of troubled sectors uh, throughout the, uh, the, the country. I'd, I'd like to take a, a, a crack at that. And I, I think I'd answer with one, one word, density. The problem with the virus is that density creates a lot of transmission. And what does New York have in abundance other than capital and on infrastructure and all of that? It has density. The smaller towns, they are by design, by the way they're built. They just will not have the density. So whatever solutions work for a place like New York, Washington DC, Boston, uh, will work much easier in a smaller town with less dense areas. You know, we were talking about offices it's going to be difficult getting up elevators and commuting in if you have the metro. Well, smaller cities have more people who are able to drive and park, and they'll be in shorter buildings, not as big a skyscraper. That means that the problem of density just is not as big a deal in those areas. Well, one other point, and this will support you, Christopher. I think you, if you think I'm coming down on you, I'm not. I'm just uh, you yeah, know, defending right. New York. Um, most of the investors I talk to are talking about diversifying their capital base. Uh, those people that go into the New Yorks, the San Fran's, the LA's of the world, they are talking about the southeastern United States and Texas. Um, and, and when I when I talk about the markets that I, I want to go to, just my five factors that I talk about are uh, foreign money. Foreign money is a, a clarion call for other money to come in. Infrastructure, talent, ease of doing business, and um, live, work, play. And many of these southeastern cities uh, in Texas have that, uh, and that's where you're seeing a lot of the capital going. That's true. But to Bert's point, this is important. There are a number of cities last year, year before that adopted rent control laws that essentially make older residential properties more abundant. And the regulators noticed this. They already started talking to the small and, and regional banks in the New York area, for example, and they said, like, no, because they look at a property that may eventually generate losses and they can't underwrite it from a loan perspective, but are you going to you know, flush a long-term customer? No. So they end up keeping it. And it's a sad thing because the, the natural constituents of these assets are small and mid-sized businessmen in the city who view it as a good investment. It's always fully let. And you know, it's a key part of the New York ecosystem. I'd like to see the governments in all these metros reconsider some of the things they've done because it doesn't help. And yet the politics are such that they don't care. So, you know, wanna, it's almost impossible to, to, to have the- I want to jump in on and mention something that no one has said anything about. Let me, can I, can I just bring in one more factor that nobody's mentioned that hadn't come up that sort of is another add-in factor? You know, the, the elimination of the SALT deduction, you know, in, in the tax reform a couple of years ago, this, uh, this is a strike against, you know, a lot of the places with density and democratic control and riots and and you and you got to wonder i mean you know every week before the crisis you'd read about the outflow of wealthy people from new york to florida and out of to california to texas and oregon and you know those are the those are the high earners and those are the people in the skyscrapers with the expensive rents and all that so i don't know anybody let me throw in something that we haven't touched on, which I think is absolutely critical, and that's going to be the election. Uh, what happens if uh, uh, Biden wins and the D's get control of the Senate and the uh, D's can uh, maintain control of the House? We will have a dramatically different political environment at a time when we're still just beginning to come out of the uh, or at least hopefully coming out of the, of the COVID crisis. And I think that is a huge question mark, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, uh, what the investment outlook is going to be. Bond market won't like it, Bert. I know, that's just one aspect of it. Uh, but I think we, uh, this also has a, a, a more specific effect in terms of what is, if, if that was to happen, what is gonna be the level of stimulus that's provided next year and how might that stimulus differ from what it's been this year? It's hard to know, especially the way we've run up the debt. Uh, one thing, the um, Main Street Federal Reserve, the Main Street Lending Program is, is just starting to get ramped up. Will that Main Street Lending Program, uh, will, will those funds uh, help 
real the real estate situation are they are they are the firms in need eligible for these type of loans or do we are we going to need some kind of new program or some you know or can can the the extent that the industry needs help can it can it find help in the in the programs that are already there do you have any uh, views on that yeah i got i got some comments i see spencer leaning forward i'll say Sorry. i'll give him a second um that depends on how long the businesses don't have cash flow we're seeing a lot of business coming back already there were six weeks when there was very little if there's another six weeks where they're they're ramping back up uh then it may not be a problem on the other hand if we have recurrent setbacks with the virus if we have other times where businesses are saying you can only have 25 percent occupancy then you get into more of a problem another number that's interesting to keep in mind uh we've had four trillion dollars of spending i showed the two trillion of that is actually still sitting in the bank if you were worried about household households we're worried about the impact on household income because that's how they pay the mortgage that's how they pay their other spending household incomes fell by something on the order of 100 billion or so in March and April, and proprietor's income fell another 30 billion. So you look at a $130 billion decline, and it's actually starting to rise. The wage and salary income is starting to rise again when you get into, into June. That 130 billion of loss is offset by 2.2 trillion. The numbers here really stack up in saying, we have thrown so much money at this. It's not all going to the right places, but there's a lot of money in there that's going to help offset some, not all of these. We're going to see rise in defaults. Of course, we see rise in defaults, but it's not a situation where uh, you're facing bottom dropping out. You'll see lending skyrocket for CNI lending this quarter. It was up 10% in the first quarter just because of the last two weeks of March, and that was corporations pulling on unused lines. Uh, this quarter, it's going to track deposit growth again, uh, and I suspect that you know the banks are almost forced to lend because if they don't, their earning assets and their re equity returns are gonna bottom out, and they already are. Um, so they are being encouraged to lend because their assets are gonna grow, what, Paul, 15, 20%? You know, it's, it's quite something. But what about the, the special lending programs that are in place? Does anybody have an opinion about whether those, those are, okay, Spencer, please. So let me, so let me jump in here. So, um, the best, most liquid market is in multifamily. Fannie and Freddie, uh, despite some of the challenges that Chris pointed out, have been doing a great job uh, because of the of transparency, the ability to go for forbearance, the ability for, for borrowers or rather for tenants not to pay rent if they are distressed. I've advocated for a similar system for the other asset classes, at least in the short term. And the short term I define as between now and the end of 2021, uh, because in the absence of that, the CMBS market is going to be extremely challenged. Some of the charts that Bert put up there are going to come to fruition because it's going to be a very difficult market, or rather you put up there, Paul, uh, long term. So we need more liquidity uh, for particularly for retail and hotels and increasingly for office. Um, so in the absence of that and in the absence of a V-shaped recovery uh, where people are, are earning income, uh, that's going to be required. Tell you know, me. that's a very important point you just made. Let me add to it. As these deals get under stress, and as you start wiping out the junior classes in these structured assets, CMBS, asset-backed securities, collateralized loan obligations, all of them have a structure of juniors and seniors. When the juniors take the loss and they get annihilated, you lose the ability to bring more deals because the arbitrage isn't there. So the arbitrage in terms of both credit and interest rates that made it possible to borrow this money over the last five years is gone. And it's not gonna come back until we convince investors that they can buy those junior pieces and not take a total loss. Alan? I'd like to step back a little bit instead of getting into the specifics of how the financing is provided. I think we all agree that firms and households need financing to get through this loss of cash flows. And the question is, where is it coming from? One of the biggest differences of now versus 2008 and 2009 is the state of the banking system. We're worried about banks, but the level of bank capital now is a completely different world from what it was in 2008. What was the most common thing we all did in 2008 and 2009? We woke up Monday morning to try to find out which of the major ba huge banks was on the ropes and might need a treasury bailout. 
we have not seen any major banks uh, in trouble like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're going to have some losses. They're provisioning for them. No one is having a run on yeah. the banks. The banks are in a much different position to provide the credit to the overall economy, which prevents this from being a financial crisis. We are having an economic crisis. We are going to have spot crises all over, but not a systemic crisis the way we did it. Yeah. You know, I would have agreed with you 30 days ago, but you know, if we see provisions above Q1, uh, Chairman Powell's going to have to reverse himself on bank dividends. But the, the well, bailout for the banking system uh, was 700 billion, uh, and it, and and we got investments back. Uh, we we made money on that. The taxpayer did. You know, uh, PPP is a 600 bill, you know billion dollar giveaway basically. So I mean. Um, the support provided for the banking system back then kind of pales compared to, to what the government's done now. Now, I'm sorry, I have to pull the plug on this. They're gonna shut us off here in, in a matter of seconds. I wanna thank all of you gentlemen, you experts for uh, having sharing an hour and a half of your afternoon with us and uh, giving us your views on the commercial real estate market. I think it's very interesting and I know I've learned a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for having us. Thank all. you. All right, bye-bye.